to someone? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good. All right. So let me know if I'm uh, not speaking into the mic and turn my head over this way or something. Um, all right. So <coughs> goals, I have a kind of a, a two part goal. Uh, the one part goal is just to sort of give you a sort of flavor of what resiliency looks like from a primary care doctor. And I think of myself really as a country doctor. Um, the other goal is to sort of, in, is sort of hopefully make you curious about some of the newer science that's been uh, shown uh, what actually happens with some of these mind-body techniques uh, to our uh, body on a sort of genetic level. And that, that uh, latter part was really what kind of changed my practice uh, or refined it about three or four years ago when I sort of, uh, although I have been quietly sort of always a fan of this sort of mind-body stuff, I decided I would come out of the closet and say, yes, I'm a mind-body believer. <laughs> uh, so the parts of the talk is sort of, and I apologize if anyone has to be out of here at 7, and I try, will try to sort of both, at one, on the one hand, not speak like I often used to, you know, like a rabbit, uh, but also not sort of drag on and get, you know, into the after 7 o'clock hour. This is a ridiculously audacious topic to, to sort of squeeze into 50 minutes. And so I apologize um, for anyone out there who's either a geneticist and knows this data better than I, or a resiliency uh, guru who thinks I'm sort of just skimming the, the tree branches. I'm going to talk a little bit about this, sort of the word resilience, and then I'm going to give you a five minute or so discussion of what I've seen over the last 20 years in terms of my clinical practice. I'm going to talk about one study that's kind of interesting and it, it links into some others on adaptation. And then we're going to back up and pause and just talk about the human brain and the stress response. Um, the theme of allostasis is really about how our bodies respond to stress. Uh, and then we're going to get into three kind of <coughs> intensely meaty studies that look at um, gene switches and what happens genetically with a variety of practices. Um, I, I am a science guy. I was um, uh, always a, sort of a believer during school as the uh, sort of the clarity of things. You know, I liked physics before I liked chemistry. I, I liked cause and effect, and I liked accuracy. If there's one sort of personality type that I, I think of myself as, it's some type of an engineer. I, I, I want data. Don't, don't give me fluff. Um, and so when I talk about science and the studies I'm going to cite, these are hardcore 95% confidence intervals, placebo control, good control groups. This is not sort of soft, we think we know what we're talking about. There are a few things that I might comment on, but I'll tell you the science isn't that good. Um, so part one, the word resilience, um, I was telling somebody, I had a professor this morning and, and he gave me a, a 10 minute recitation of the last 3,000 years of the use of the word resilience. And I, and I had this cold sweat. I thought, oh my God, I have no idea what I'm even talking about. Um, um, and actually, I, I, I added the, uh, something in terms of the definition in a minute, but I'll get back to that. So I'll say something relational here. Um, why, I, why I personally got in, interested in this is because of my own little story as a human being. Um, all of us have had a variety of dings and, and bangs in our life. All of us have come back from a variety of adversity. And my own experience was, was, is no, no different. Um, I was a sort of sickly kid. I think one year I actually missed 47 days of school. Uh, so I was not a particularly endowed, resilient kid. Um, and because of that, I was, I think, as I went through in college and things, I became kind of interested in, uh, in health, but also in what that, what that notion was. How do you kind of bounce back? What was it about my upbringing that didn't uh, have me bounce back? Um, the definition of resiliency that I, would, I like, and, the, and it's really probably the best, is the first word, and this is what the professor told me this morning. He said there was an ancient... Greek word which translates to um, imperturbability. Um, <coughs> the others came from a really interesting article on um, resilience and trauma. Um, and it's not really that complicated. It takes licking and keeps on ticking. Um, so clinical lessons. Um, I've been practicing for 19, almost 20 years. I was trying to figure out if I saw 60,000 or 70,000 patient visits over that time, but it's around 50,000. 
Um, lots of these folks I saw many times, so I got to know them over um, a long period. But there's six, seven, seven, eight thousand different patient stories I've heard. Um, early in my practice, I had no interest in, in resilience. I, I certainly wanted to help people in a very sort of very sort of sophomoric way. Um, what I found in listening to people's stories with the sort of uh, jaw-dropping amazement what people endured was that there were some like there were some things that I was learning. I was learning. I was providing some care, but I was learning a tremendous amount about how people live and cope. Um, I think my most important slide with this topic is this one. Resilience is really a mystery. Like I said, everybody in here has had lots of dings in their life and will have more dings, right? That's, this is an inevitable bang up, high contact sport. Um, and what, what happens and how people adapt to it or don't adapt to it um, is really a, a very, very deeply personal, it's very deeply cultural, and it's, um, it's, a, it's a mysterious process. So what we get to in the sort of sciencey part of the slides um, is uh, interesting, and it sort of it shows the huge power of, of science to sort of get into ourselves. But the mystery of what makes each person resilient is, um, is really that. Um, and I don't think of uh, resilience necessarily as you know, Usain Bolt uh, or like an athletic experience. I, I've seen lots of very crumbled, uh, dying people show tremendous uh, resilience and, and, and uh, spirit. And so the word is a little bit of a misnomer. One of the things that I think most people that I've had those experiences with, that uh, you know, they tell me a variety of parts of their life story. Um, many of my staff and I say, you know, uh, you know, I, I, I we talk with students or residents, and we say, like, this is one of the stories I heard this morning. And uh, learners will often say, how did you keep a straight face? I mean, how did you not just fall over? And we learn very quickly, because we don't know anything, to have a sort of flat affect, right? You talk to your doctor, they say, yeah. So we learned that very, very early on. And, uh, but one of the things I, I, I've learned you know, I, when I've heard these stories from patients um, is that they really integrate their traumas and, and into their life. Uh, they don't sort of define them necessarily. It's sort of an integrative pro process. Um, Content, uh, uh, I'm sorry, context, not content, is a theme that sort of goes into the parable of the, the, the man, or the person who sees uh, three people working on a building and asks the first person, what are you doing? And the first guy says, I'm you know, chipping stone, I'm banging this, I'm going to slide it into position, uh, you know, I can't be bothered. You ask the second guy, what are you doing? He says, I'm just working, nine to five, I'm taking a paycheck, buying some food, I'm going home. You ask the third guy, what are you doing here? He says, I'm, I'm building a hospital, or I'm building a library, or I'm building a physical therapy building. I'm doing something with my life that's so meaningful and rich. Way after I'm gone, it's going to be this wonderful structure. The idea is, is that a lot of folks, when, you, when I talk with them and, and ask them, how do you get through this? Uh, they put it into a certain context where they sort of see themselves in a slightly different light. It's not sort of a sort of narcissistic all about me experience. It's like, no, this is just part of life. Um, one of my favorite of all time, uh, I had a very, very uh, interesting case in Boston when I was training, and a lady had part of her leg amputated. She lived in a tenement house. She was very poor. Um, literally parking outside her house to go see her was kind of a risky endeavor. Um, when we were doing house calls in Boston, we were always counseled, you know, no white coat, no stethoscope, no doctor's bag, right? Like, you just go in with, with a, like, a garbage bag. And, uh, and I asked this woman, I said, so how is it that you have been endured this amputation and this stuff? And she had her glasses all askew, and she looked at me, and she said, Dr. Schwartz, my mom always said, God, don't make no jump. <laughs> wow, holy Toledo. <laughs> A lot of people, but not everybody, is lucky enough to have this notion. A lot of people, um, I think, with their vocation, their life story, um, have a, a, this sort of uh, interesting psychological construct of flow. And I think it's worthwhile, this wonderful TED Talk, this wonderful book written about flow. Um, and it's the idea of flow is when time, when you're doing something, 
the intentional thing that you're doing. And time gets weird. Like three hours go by and it feels like it's 15 minutes. That's sort of an interesting altered psychological state. That sort of state is referred to um, by some psychologists as flow. Um, and this great guy, Michele, and I wish I could say his last name fluently, but I can't, um, has this really wonderful, um, I think it's about a 40 minute TED talk on flow. And uh, it's really sort of the subtitle is What Makes a Life Worth Living? It's a fascinating notion, and it really dovetails with a lot of the mind-body stuff that I'll sort of get to. The other thing that is interesting, and this is all interesting and pertinent to all of you, and all of your families, and all of your extended folks that you see, is people know what works for them. They know where their strengths come from. And what is so interesting is so often people forget you know, you see somebody, they, you know, there's 50, 60, 70, doesn't matter, and, and they, they're struggling with something severe, and the, you ask them, well, you've dealt with other things before that have been horrible or traumatic. How did you do it? Well, that was different. No, no, how did you do it? Walk me through. Because inherently, it's their own story, which often needs to get magnified. There's a very interesting psychological thing where when something is brain spanking new and scary and threatening, we sort of assume that it's brain spanking new, when in fact many of the tools we've already utilized are tools that can push us through these uh, next trying times. All right, so I'm going to switch to um, an interesting uh, 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 research paper that was on adaption. And you'll wonder, Adam, you're talking about monkeys, you're not talking about people, can you please bring it back to home and it'll come back. So, macaque monkeys are fascinating. I don't know anything about monkey research. I did some chicken research, but macaque, <laughs> apparently, so this study, oh, we just get to the study. Uh, so the study was published in 2012, was social environments associated with gene regulation variations and the rhesus macaque immune system. Okay. So they took eight uh, female rhesus monkeys, all the same age. They um, had them each in an individual little uh, uh, habitats uh, for a week, and then they introduced them individually to a group habitat. And it turns out, which I didn't know, uh, that the social order, the hierarchy of these monkeys would be determined by which, when they were introduced into the habitat. So by definition, the first one takes the first rank. 24 hours later, they introduce another monkey, and they, then that monkey, by definition, sort of goes up, grooms the others. It's much more deferential, much less um, uh, likely to be anything aggressive, and that hierarchy is related to their introduction into the uh, habitat. What they did was they looked and they, they did uh, blood samples of each monkey before they put them in the habitat, and then after a week of having all eight of them in the habitat, they um, brought them back out, they took a media blood sample, and they looked at their genes. And then they, they had the social scientist uh, people who were ranking them based on their behavior, and then they had a blinded group of researchers who were looking at just their gene activation. And they said, can you predict, based on gene activation, which was the higher ranking monkey? So that was basically the design. Without ridiculously overstating it. The, um, the answer was they could. 80% of the time, um, based on these, the, what people, what their scientists were looking at in their gene activation, whether it's up activated or down regulated, they can predict um, which monkeys were in the higher rank. Um, so the, the, not only did social rank and uh, behavior within the enclosure um, sort of, was it phenotypically or visual? But actually, when you looked at them genetically, you could see that you had stress hormones turning on if they were lower rank monkeys, and inflammatory mediators being turned on if they're lower rank monkeys, and vice versa. One of the funnest things about this study is after they did a, a week-long washout with each of the monkeys in their own, in own little enclosures, and they introduced them again to the same environment in a different order. And again, the first one in was number one, and 80% of the time it can be determined based on their genetics after the week and the enclosure. The, the, the bullet point there is we are, we, well, we have stress responses, and when, when, conversely, when we make situations that move us to better stress, lower stress situations, 
we're just not just changing you know, our sort of warm and fuzzy, we're actually changing gene regulation in a significant way. So backing up for a second, sorry. Um, human brain and stress response. This will be review for probably everybody, but I'll just bang through a few slides. Um, consciousness, I did a talk about eight years ago on PTSD and fibromyalgia at the VA. I was really interested in, in I still am interested, of course, in pain and these syndromes. But I went, when I went into the medical literature to look up what the research was on consciousness, I was blown away and, of course, completely ignorant. Most of the research done in consciousness is math. It is ridiculously higher order math, like I'm sure my brain couldn't even like, get into it. Um, so when I say the word consciousness, just backing up into, um, you know, I would say we are, this, we are these huge neurologic sensory systems, right? That all we do is take in information, we have the visual, the auditory, the taste, the smell. We have all these great neurons, and they are just flooding our brain with ridiculous data every few microseconds. And the brain's ridiculously hard task is to try to sort this out. What's, what's noise, what's threat, what's not threat, what's possible meal? Um, uh, that's the sort, of, sort of fundamental job. There's a few areas in the brain that are sort of the primary um, sort of arousal and memory centers. We sort of refer them, I refer to them fr frequently as the monkey brain. It's sort of our intuitive, it's sort of reactionary sense. And within the monkey brain, or within our primitive brains, right kind of behind our sinuses, are these two large uh, glands, the amygdalas. And just as an aside, I've got to share this, because there's so much data on resilience and mind-body stuff. But you, this, is, this is also grade A data. With relaxation training, you can shrink your amygdala. You can measure it, and you can learn relaxation training, and you can shrink its size. So our reactivity, whether we're watching too many CNN things, or we're on Facebook too much and getting all cranky, those are all things that are mutable. Those are completely part of our body's muscle if we want to keep worrying and freaking out about things, or we could choose to sort of back off. The role of the amygdala is really just to sort of, um, it, it is almost like a reflex arc. So we all know that if a doctor cracks your elbow, your arm's going to jump, and in fact, that happens even if your brain is not on at all. It actually happens more if your brain isn't on. Um, the amygdala does the same thing, but with all these other sense, sense areas. So we, 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 hear, we hear a noise, and, and with, without any frontal lobe action, our amygdala is already processing whether that's a threat or not. So it's all, it, it, it's, it's a, is it a threat, or do I not need to be worried? The fight or flight response is obviously something everyone's heard that, that phrase. I like this slide because there's, it's a little bit more complicated. You know, obviously stress is not all bad, right? There's lots of stress that is fabulous. Um, and so the fight or flight response also includes the notion of freezing. Um, so if you get into a ridiculously overwhelming, stressful situation, the freeze is sort of not flight nor fight. And it's not a particularly great experience. I've been there. You don't think very well. Um, the face uh, response is kind of what I'm doing now. I'm scared shitless, but I'm not overly reacting. Uh, <laughs> there's um, sort of two main uh, anatomical pathways in the body that's not that important to get into. But on the right is the short, uh, the short term uh, sort of reflex arc. So if we do hear, you know, some horrible, loud, kabooming crash, you know, we're all going to flinch. And that happens, really, that's a neurologic phenomenon. What happens with more prolonged stress is that it does become a kind of hormonal thing. And we get, our whole systems get activated. So our blood pressure goes up, our skin tone goes way down, our bowels get all weird, um, usually, and our muscles get pretty tense. <coughs> So now the stasis. This next slide is kind of, I think, one of my favorites. And that is the, um, I have to admit, too, that when I was in medical school and all during my training, no one ever used the phrase allostasis. And to my mind, I have no idea why. Maybe it wasn't just described why. Um, this, after all, is 2015. The idea is, is that we all have sort of <coughs> default set points. 
And when things happen to us on a given day, um, sometimes with stress, our, our sort of stress responses uh, are activated. We're, we're jacked. You know, I get a call from my kid's college, the loan didn't go through, and when am I going to pay write the check, right? I'm like, oh, geez. Um, and what happens after I try to hopefully figure that out and do some prayer um, is that my stress response goes down. The problem with our, and I, I would say this you know, very proudly, one of the problems with our culture is that we've gotten into a sort of chronic stress uh, state where chronic stress is kind of considered okay. Um, and I, I love, I heard this great podcast recently with this guru from, uh, uh, from India, and he was asked a question about stress management. He started laughing, like a really good belly laugh. And he was like, what is it with you Americans? Why would you manage stress? You should manage things that are precious. You don't manage stress. You get rid of stress. <laughs> that is enlightening. Um, the idea, though, is, and, and I see this, I see this a lot, and obviously my patients, I see a lot of my colleagues, chronic stress, this allostatic load, is a real problem. It's a problem not only because we don't think as well when we're chronically stressed, um, but we certainly don't react to the world in, in the same way. Back in uh, 2001, this was a very interesting study done, and I don't know the details of the study, but it was a study on successful aging. It took folks who were 70, followed them out for 10 years. And one of the interesting things was they had clinicians assess, I think it was 250 folks who were 70, year, 70 to 73, and they had them assess them both with, with, within a, a story, their, their narrative, as well as biological markers for their allostatic load. Not surprising um, was over the seven years, is allostatic load has a significant independent effect on mortality. Mm -hmm. So if you're chronically stressed, you will not live as long. That's just, that's reality. Um, and it's not a big surprise. So this is where I, I was, um, I treated myself three years ago to go to this conference in Boston. And uh, I'll tell you just because it's a funny story. Uh, when I was training, uh, I'm Adam, there was a ridiculously bright woman who was named Eve. Uh, she was <laughs> a year younger, and I, when I was a chief resident, she was clearly one of the top in her class. And I said, so Eve, are you going to take the chief job if they give it to you? And she said, no, I think I'm going to go to the, the Harvard and do mind-body fellowship. And I thought, whoa! Because I was kind of always, again, kind of in the closet, mind-body guy, but I had no idea that somebody of her calendar was headed there. So a few years ago, I got my Harvard newsletter to say, you know, come down to various conferences. And it had um, Herb Benson, who if anyone wants a book on relaxation, Herb's relaxation response is sort of still kind of pinnacle book. Um, Herb Benson was retiring after his 40-year tenure there. And uh, Herb uh, as a, had a guest speaker, and the guest speaker was Eve. And I was like, that's it. I'm going down to find out what these smart people have up their sleeve. <laughs> So next study is a fairly simple, straightforward study. Um, it was looking at Tai Chi. And what it showed was, um, it was a, it's a, again, science. I'm a total zealot for being clear. If, if it's good science, not so good science, you've got your science. Great study. And I, one of the things that tells you it's a great study is when you, as you read it, is it's very clear about its study design. They have a placebo group, which isn't a placebo group, it's, a, it's sort of a um, cognitive behavioral therapy group uh, um, talking with, about sort of health education. And same amount of time, same time period, they looked at folks before in the placebo group, or control group, and the intervention group. And what they showed, again, just looking at inflammatory markers, what they showed very, very clearly was Tai Chi over the course of a half a year statistically lowered their inflammatory mediators, IL-6, which we can talk about a lot, and you'll see IL-6 come up in some other slides. So Tai Chi, and I'm not a Tai Chi guy, and I can't tell you exactly what Tai Chi is, but Tai Chi is a sort of mind-body uh, way of getting your breathing and your body movements and concentrating uh, over a certain series of movements over a period of time clearly brings you back in touch with your body, so it's not the worry wheel, uh, and has a profound effect on inflammation. Okay, next study is, I would say, is medium ridiculously hard. Um, this is a Tai Chi study as well. They looked at um, cancer survivors that had insomnia. Um, and again, ridiculously good study design. 
It was not sort of a you know pilot study. Let's see how 50 people do. This was a study that looked it took took a control group and looked and compared a huge number more than just IL-6 to see if the chai chi have an effect. Um, without sort of overstating it, I will I'll say that statistically, Tai Chi had a very, very, very strong effect over the control group, which was co CBT as cognitive behavioral therapy. So these are folks who were not just sort of said, sorry, you have insomnia, and see you later. These are folks who were given counsel, had a lot of time spent to sort of understand insomnia and see if that was going to impact it. Unfortunately, not only didn't it impact insomnia, because insomnia is more primitive brain, um, but it didn't uh, have any effect, uh, had no effect on their uh, uh, inflammatory mediators. This is a kind of complicated slide, and I'm not very happy with it, but the idea is, is that the Tai Chi group you know, had a reduction in the pro-inflammatory numbers. It also had a very substantial improvement in their immune function, and this was measured by antiviral and antibody function. So something really, really cool happens when you get your body sort of back in touch with itself. You get the breathing back in touch with itself. And here's, here's the study. Uh, let's put the title up here. So relaxation response induces temporal transcriptome changes in energy metabolism, insulin secretion, and inflammatory pathways. When I watched this study being talked about, I was speechless. Because uh, I was a, when I, I got a master's degree in genetics, so I was a little bit familiar with the idea of chromosomes, genes, regulation up and down. But the depth of the science here, really, and I don't claim to be able to translate it to you in five minutes meaningfully, but the depth of the science here completely blew me away. So what they did was um, they looked at, uh, they, looked, they looked at, they had three groups. They had uh, a novice group, so they, this was down in Harvard. They asked, uh, they put out a flyer and said, who wants to be interested in learning mind-body medicine? Uh, I think it was 30 or 40 people said, sure, I'll, I'll be interested in learning it. No previous training. And then they said that we need to find some long-term practitioners. So they found an equal number, about 30 or so in the greater Boston area, of folks who have been doing um, either Tai Chi, Qigong, uh, meditation, or, um, or Tai Chi. And they then invited them into the study. And what they did in the study was they took the novice group and simply sat them down, talked to them about the study, and drew blood. Mm -hmm. And then um, they did that for all the novice groups. And then they took the novices through an eight-week course in mind-body uh, medicine. They gave them each a CD and said, we want you to listen for an hour a day. We want you to get back in touch with your body and your breathing, relaxation response. And then at the end of the eight weeks, we're going to have you come back in and we're going to study you. So this next few slides are going to get ridiculous. But so the novice group is before any training. Novice two is the folks that, who are the same people as the control group. They've just come back and had their training. And then the M group is the long-term practitioners. Um, so this. Um, you know, again, I was a genetics guy a little bit, but I had never seen anything like this before. I was like, what the hell am I looking at? Um, so these are referred to as gene heat maps. And what they did with the, the blood, I probably should bank back up. So what they did with the blood was they took uh, 10 cc's of blood out, two teaspoons, not a lot of blood. They spun the blood down and they took off a white blood cell layer of monocytes. And monocytes are kind of fun because they're white blood cells that circulate throughout the entire body. They took out about you know, 30 or 40,000 monocytes and then stuck them, as they, after they did a little pre-digestion, on a gene chip. And the gene chip analyzed 44,000 genes, for whether they were upregulated, neutral, or downregulated. And what the top left shows is the, uh, so this is the novice group, this is the novice groups who've learned something, and this is the long-term meditators. What they found was there were 318 genes that were similar between uh, both the somewhat experienced meditators and the very experienced meditators. And they're going to talk about it in a second, but they really drilled into like, what are those genes? What was upregulated? And likewise, um, novice group, uh, short term meditators, long term, 279 genes were downregulated. So they, again, using technology that I can barely verbalize, 
what they did was they then mapped out those genes to find out which genes are turning on and which genes are turning off. What they then did is they showed in these sort of schematics, the top one is the upregulated genes, and the middle one is the downregulated genes. And what they showed was, again, in the metabolism genes, insulin secretion, insulin use, utilization, um, blood sugar, um, and inflammatory pathways were dramatically altered with these mind-body techniques. And that uh, notion, and there were more impressive or more complex changes that happen in long-term meditators. But that uh, notion was sort of, um, before these studies really had not been isolated down to the genetic level. So relaxation states, and again, it doesn't matter what you're doing, Tai Chi, Qigong, uh, and, and Herb Benson would say, that includes mindfully gardening, that includes really loving your knitting, or really loving uh, tying flies. Mindful, intentional states where you get relaxed and into the zone change your DNA. May not, may not change the gene you were born with, but it changes its regulation, particularly in inflammatory cascades. So the science in review, monkeys, gene activation and suppression, again, like the last studies, it is, we are not just our behaviors, our bodies actually change when we get into certain situations. And the one I like about the monkeys is if, when you change your situation, so when you have that ridiculously hard task of downsizing, and you think, oh my god, this might kill me, when you change your situation to something less allostatically loading, your body, your genes will also change, and you become, interestingly, more resilient. Um, doing Tai Chi and the breast cancer survivors likewise turned up and down inflammatory cascades and like I said the relaxation response does a lot to metabolism. So outline wise that's sort of, how did I do? Not bad. Uh, outline wise that's sort of the bulk of what I wanted to, to blab about. I wanted to tie together the, the last, uh, the two parts of my talk a little bit. Um, you know I'm a country doc and the clinical stories I've heard and I will reiterate, um, do continually fascinate me. I mean, absolutely fascinate me. Um, and the uh, myriad of styles and ways people cope, I think, are really uh, probably one of the most uh, kind of interesting uh, and informative uh, pieces. I, I always say, you know, there are no shoulds. You know, somebody says, well, should I do Tai Chi? Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, I'm not a should guy, and I don't think shoulds are very useful. Um, you know, but I should lose weight. Why? Um, and I think the uh, one, a couple of the features in terms of folks who very obviously have been through you know, really serious traumas and, and things, owning, uh, integrating, and enduring uh, things, I think are what foster resilience. And I would go back in terms of your families and kids. I think that people have endured, friends of yours, yourself, uh, people that you're going to run into that are going through a hard time, they have their own stories, and most of the time, the real meat and potatoes of their healing is reiterating and helping them remember their own stories. The gene stuff is really fascinating, and I do like it. Um, I know that um, Bill and I have sort of kindred spirits in sort of the mind-body world. Um, I wanted to share the science with you, because if, they're, if you're on the fence at all, whether this is anything other than sort of, you know, sort of 60s post, you know, LSD or something. There's, there's actually a lot of ridiculously cool science here. Um, one of the interesting, slightly sad things that's happened, and not surprisingly, is a lot of this science has sort of gone industry. Um, this science is now they're looking at sort of like, okay, so there's a, there's a certain marker, uh, NK um, uh, uh, lambda B, and there's a, there's a lot of industry looking into can we put that in a pill? Because if we can do those things with a pill, then you won't need to do Tai Chi. You just simply take our pill. And it's true that, that, that a lot of health science, in, even in my career, has gone from sort of government funding to industry funding to the order of 90%. Uh, and so although the science is out there, it's widely described and written about, it doesn't get quite the press that I think you might agree it deserves. Questions, comments, rotten tomatoes? Oh, it's a relaxation response. So Herb would say that the uh, Herb Benson, 
The relaxation response book is really, it's, it's fabulous. Um, you know, it, it is a, uh, I'll tell you a short story. Um, one thing that I, I don't lack of is the ability to blab. Um, so a couple, a year ago, I had this great gal, she's moving south, and she's uh, older, she has very severe medical problems, and I asked her, uh, how, oh, she has a breathing problem, and I said, so how are you coping with this stress? And she said, oh, I do my breathing exercises, Doc. And I was like, well, I'm a meditator. You're talking about diaphragm breathing? And she sort of rolled her eyes at me and said, it's more complicated than that. Um, and she walked me through like a three-minute thing about sort of deep breathing. Um, the relaxation response is really ridiculously easy to induce. Um, and once it's induced, it's also very, very easy to call on. So you can be in a situation where you can't necessarily, you know, home out, but you can say, oh, hold it, I know how to go there. Uh, and it's so called practice. Any other questions or comments? Because I was an art educator for many years, and I used to teach from a book called Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain. Uh, Betty Edwards wrote a book. She talked about, you know, brain science and how when you're activating your, your right hemisphere, you can uh, be in that sort of um, zone you talked about, the flow, where you lose track of time, because that part of your brain that keeps track of time is, is left hemisphere center. Does any of that still make sense with what you're... Oh, yeah. No, the uh, conference I went to was was kind of a week-long, mind-blowing experience, and, and one of the... One of the uh, hour-long sessions was uh, small groups and we were given paper and pencil and asked us to do certain things. It was, uh, there was literature parts, there was sort of write poetry. Um, the, the, uh, there's a huge amount of research and sort of evidence, if you will, on, on art as well as music. Uh, the ability to listen to your favorite song you know, before you do something stressful and what it does to us sort of both hormonally, uh, reactionary wise, is, is, is very well described. And I think, again, the more you look into this and the more you see the sort of science of it, which is valid because we're sort of in a deity of science, um, that it, is, it is deeply refreshing to many of the things that we were all taught, whether by our parents, grandparents, aunts, and uncles. Mm. Yeah? So, depression, is that a way people handle not having resilience? Mm. That's a good question. I would say definitely not. 